everybody. So it's my absolute pleasure today to be joined by, I have to say, one of the world's greatest classical saxophonists in Timothy McAllister. And he's not only here to do a lovely video for us, which is exactly what you're watching now, but later on tonight he's going to be performing a clinic for us at the back of the room right here. And I mean, Tim really needs no introduction. So with that said, I'm actually just going to dive straight into the main topic of conversation to start this video, which is this new mouthpiece that you've been in heavily involved in terms of well, designing the mouthpiece in collaboration with back and mouthpieces. Can you tell us a little bit about the mouthpiece? Well, thanks for having me right. at your legendary Legend. store. It's great to be here in this, you know, one of the great cities in the world. What can and, I say? Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's a real treat to, to be involved with this company. Um, Bakun has devoted itself to, to really developing, I wouldn't say bespoke, but, mm. but crafted mouthpieces and clarinets particularly um, for years now that, that have really elevated in the market. Mm. The saxophone mouthpiece is their first foray into the saxophone world. Mm. And it was really born out of a relationship with a very famous mouthpiece craftsman named Richard Hawkins, okay. who is their primary designer now. So he's been designing the Vocally series of clarinet mm. mouthpieces, and he's currently designing signature series for yeah. various artists. Mm. And for about 30 years, yeah. I had been going to Richard as a friend, as a confidant, to mm. help me with mouthpieces. Essentially, he taught me everything I know about refacing, okay mouthpieces. Um, he learned from another legendary craftsman in the United States named Robert Scott, mm -hmm. who passed away many years ago. And he really, he really passed all of that information forward. Mm. And it was a chance for us to put our heads together and mm. say, what has been historically missing mm. from a saxophone mouthpiece? Okay. And he felt the time was right because the company was willing to take this chance mm. to get out of their their, their, their center line. Mm. You know, we are a clarinet company. Mm. That's what we do. And we take our time to build some of the world's greatest clarinets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. It, he came to me uh, in, in 2019, just before the pandemic, to say that he had started this new partnership with this company. Okay. And he had the idea of a saxophone mouthpiece and they jumped on board. Mm. So he came to me. Mm. And so I was very honored by this. And at the time I was very, I, wouldn't, I wasn't skeptical, but I was very committed to my relationships uh, with the Selmer company, mm. with the Van Doren company. I think I was a little bit nervous mm. about venturing into something that was completely untested. <laughs> Now, well, it's interesting that you touch on Van Doren and Selma, obviously two household brands there, mm -hmm, and so course. well known yeah. in terms of the classical saxophone mouthpiece world. And so I suppose you must have had in your head the idea that if you're going to essentially compete with those brands, you, you have to be offering something that's that's going to be as good quality-wise, and if not, offer something different for the classical and, audience to enjoy. And from the very beginning, I believed that if it didn't match that quality, yeah. I, did, I wasn't going to be involved. Mm. But we also didn't want to recreate what they do so right. well. I mean, these are legendary brands that mm -hmm. have very specific specifications. I mean, the, 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 design, the design of those mouthpieces mm. are, are tried and true, and they've been tested for decades. Yeah. Yeah. We wanted to maybe take the mouthpiece in a slightly different mm. direction. Well, let's start with the TM1. Sure. So there's two models here. And just talk to me about the basic design of the mouthpiece and how it compares to, for example, um, you know, an S80 or an S90 and what the differences are. Sure. Well, back in there. the hallmark of the S80 and why it, why it was so uh, such an important part of the market and continues to be one of the world's most played and famous mouthpieces, was that iconic square chamber mm. that evolved out of 
the, the experimentations with horseshoe chamber sure. that we saw with the soloist line uh, coming out of the 1940s mm -hmm. and 50s and 60s, and then starting to square that up and, and change the, the internal chamber into almost a shoebox design, sure. like a concert hall yeah. in some way. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to experiment with creating something more oval. Mm not necessarily circular, not completely, not yeah. really a, a symmetrical circle. I can see that now. something that was a little higher at the top. Yeah. And that the, the lower the lower shelf, the ramp mm. here, mm. Would, would basically shape into that. Sure. And we also, one of the hallmark features was to create a, a, a tapered baffle, mm. a baffle that tapers into the chamber. Part of the rationale there was that was aerodynamics, okay. essentially a funnel design mm. in some ways to get us deeper, to, to get a little bit more immediacy. And it was really quite a bit of trial and error right. before we reached a point where we were comfortable putting it into the market. Okay. And the mouthpiece was almost exclusively designed in a pandemic over, <laughs> over, over Zoom meetings. Sure. This is the TM2 yeah. now, so can you point us to really the, the reasoning between, uh, you know, for having two models in the first place and where the differences are between the two? Well, I think the TM2 is actually the primary model. It's okay. the model that, that, that we started with. We wanted something that mirrored the classic C-Star facing, the classic C-Star lay, and the lay schedule. Sure. Um, we wanted to appeal to that, that midline in the market of people that played C-Stars mm. with strength three reads. Right. Right. Nothing too soft, nothing too hard. Yeah. But its, it's primary difference here is clearly how that relates to the chamber. And then we, we have a thicker tip rail than, than we might typically see on a Selmer okay. mouthpiece. It's a thicker tip rail that probably mirrors a little bit more of the Van Doren line, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of experimenting with, with, in some ways, characteristics of all of the famous mm -hmm. lines, okay. but, but we, we decided to, to attack one area mm -hmm. that, that would be something very different, being okay. the, the chamber and how the baffle enters into the chamber. Okay. But the, uh, the, the TM2 sits at about a typical, mm -hmm. Um, one one point five three opening. It sits. Uh, it, the, the lay schedule sits pretty identical mm. to a, an S eighty C star yeah. or an S ninety one ninety. Just kind of where you want it, really, for that, yeah. for that style of playing. such a deep supporter of the Selmer company, okay. but for about 30 years, I was playing the, the, the S90, 190. Mm -hmm. There were times I would, for different purposes, I would experiment with 180s, mm -hmm. and I'd, so which was, was a little bit more of a closed facing. Mm -hmm. There were times I even experimented with 170s, mm -hmm. and I knew many of my favorite colleagues, some of my favorite players in the profession, really mm -hmm. loved a 170 mm -hmm. with a strength four read. Wow. So there was, there was a movement to go more closed mm. with a much harder read. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the TM1 is, is meant to hit mm -hmm. in the market. For mm. people that are that are not a huge fan of a more open mouthpiece mm. with a softer read. Yeah. In fact though, I think the TM2, I've, I've talked to jazz performers mm. who feel that it has a flexibility in it where they can use it in a, mm. in a particularly a pit se uh, mm. scenario or a, a right. more so it even has that scenario. flexibility to yeah. move into that. that it has a lot of flexibility because of its chamber. I right. mean, th there, there are even characteristics mm. here that I, I think I cherish in, a, in, a, in an old New York Meyer. I mean, I actually found that a little bit myself. I mean, the reason you don't see me sat here or stood here with a saxophone around my neck and demonstrating, I'm certainly not going to be doing it in front of yourself. You are the expert in this style. But um, most of us here, really, in, in sax.co, we come from a sort of jazz background. And I find, so I find it interesting when I'm giving, given a classical mouthpiece to test, because I almost have to switch my thinking sure. into that style. And even there's embouchure changes, which I can't quite 
put into place when I'm trying to play in that style. So instead I have to think the sound in my head. But actually, on saying all that, I did immediately warm to this mouthpiece. I thought, oh, here we go. It's just not going to happen for me because I just don't play in that style. I used to be an oboist, but that's another story. But I've developed... <laughs> won't a, hold it we, yeah, don't hold it. <laughs> but I've, you know, I've developed a jazz on my sure. that's slightly more open yeah. lip. And, and you, I, you know all the rest of it. I feel and that that approach can, can work well, well with a team. Well, that's what I was going to go on to say because I felt that I did have that sort of slightly kind of Meyer-esque Mm -hmm. sound there and I could also feel that I could concentrate the sound and get that uh, um, lovely floaty sound that you wonderful classical players derive so it, it seemed to cross over a little bit for me yeah. which I really enjoyed that aspect of it. In some ways, this mouthpiece is a response to all of the, the things that I was wishing mm. from some of the other lines mm. over the years. Mm. Some, something that just wasn't built into the DNA of those mouthpieces. Mm. Something that I was asking Richard Hawkins, who yeah. I mentioned, I was asking him to experiment. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you lengthen the lay here? Can, mm -hmm. you, can you change the throat a little bit here? Can yeah. you, can you uh, clean up the tip rail or could we, could we, could we make the tip real thicker or okay. more narrow. I, mean, okay. I was asking him to do things that just were not part of the standard right. specifications. Right. Yeah. And we were getting a lot of different effects yeah. from that yeah. over the years. And there were m many mouthpieces yeah. I've played that were very highly doctored mouthpieces, yeah. even though they were, yeah. you know, right off the line. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It must have been really exciting for him as well to you know, take part in this new venture for him because it's something so different, as you say, to the clarinet side of things. Sure, and yeah. and we're and we're we're going to be launching the soprano saxophone yeah. model very soon. Yeah, uh, it's in the beta testing stage right, right now. Right, right. And they've already yeah. started to create the schematics mm. for the tenor mouthpiece. So mm. we're we're gonna we'll have the full line SATV right. within right. I'd say within a year. Yeah, yeah, fabulous. 